Preface of the Chaucer Storybook. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Beth Thomas. The Chaucer Storybook by Eva March Tappan. Preface. It has been somewhat the fashion of late to declare that the difficulty of reading Chaucer has been greatly overestimated. Probably it has for some people. Chaucer, compared with Beowulf, for instance, is play. For one who knows a little French, a little German, and a little Latin, who has a shadowy recollection of Grimm's law, a good memory for obsolete and half-obsolete expressions, and a natural talent for discovering the gist of a word no matter how it is spelled, it is a simple matter to read Chaucer. Doubtless it would be better if every one would read everything in the exact form which it took in its author's mind, the Canterbury Tales included. But, though most people claim to be able to appreciate humour, pathos, character-drawing, mischievous satire, and love of nature, and though all these qualities are found abundantly in the poetry of Chaucer, yet I have never met man, woman, or child who, without a preparation somewhat akin to that just outlined, had ever read the Canterbury Tales for pleasure that is why the chaucer story-book has been written the twelve stories chosen are those requiring fewest omissions to adapt them to the taste of the present day eva march tappan august three nineteen o eight end of preface chapter one of the chaucer story-book this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Chaucer Storybook by Eva March Tappan. Chapter 1 At the Tabard Inn. Harry Bailey, landlord of the Tabard Inn, stood in the open doorway listening he heard the loud skirling of a bagpipe the jingling of little bells the slender notes of a flute then a snatch of a song and after it a hearty laugh the tramping of hoofs sounded nearer and nearer and up the street that led from london bridge there came at an easy pace a company of riders i'll warrant they're bound for the tabard said the landlord to himself and he called to his serving men ho there strew fresh rushes in the hall put another log on the fire the air is cool when one has been riding see you to it that the kitchen fire there was no time for further orders and no one could have heard them if they had been given for the bagpipe was shrieking louder than ever as if to show that great folk were close at hand and in another moment the travellers were clattering into the yard of the inn alighting from their horses and climbing up the steps into the gallery and thence into the house what a company they were it was no wonder that the grown folk as well as the children had stared at them curiously as they rode up the street first of all came a tall dignified knight still wearing part of his armour and showing by the stains left on his jupon or short tunic that he had come directly from some campaign his son followed him as squire a handsome young man of twenty years with curly hair and a merry face no matter what the haste had been he had found time to put on a fresh tunic a beautiful one all embroidered with red and white flowers it was he who had been playing so merrily on his flute as they rode up the street behind him came his yeoman in hood and coat of green he carried a bow and arrows a sword and buckler a horn and a dagger the pretty little nun a prioress who followed them together with another nun and three priests had taken time to make her toilet too for she looked as dainty and neat and smiling as if she had been riding through green fields instead of over a dusty road a rosary hung on her arm 
with beads of gleaming coral gordered with green the little jingling bells were on the bridle rein of the most jovial of monks his fiddle was in a bag at his side his sleeves were trimmed with the finest of fur and his hood was fastened under his chin with a handsome clasp of good yellow gold wrought into the shape of a love knot his horse was large and strong and richly caparisoned and the monk rode as if he were as much at home on horseback as on his own feet he rides like a hunter and if i do not guess amiss he would rather go a hunting than sit in a cloister and pore over a book thought a quiet traveller who was standing at a corner of the gallery watching the newcomers with bright keen eyes he had arrived at the inn that morning and on the following day he meant to ride on to canterbury for he was on a pilgrimage to the shrine of st thomas a becket his face was small and thoughtful and he had a way of looking down upon the ground as if he were searching for something or dreaming of something far away but there was a gentle curve about his lips as if he loved a jest and had a pretty wit of his own he looked much amused when one of the company a friar laid aside his cowl so carefully it was plain to see that it was well filled with knives and pins and other things to sell and that he meant to do more than hear confessions and give absolutions he meant to make a penny or two for himself whenever he had a chance he was humming a strain of a merry ballad but he stopped as he came near a rather pompous-looking gentleman with a forked beard a merchant for whom or for whose money-bags the friar had evidently great respect this merchant wore a tall flemish hat with a long feather standing upright in it the rest of his dress too was costly and even the clasps of his shoes were of shining gold no one could help seeing at a glance that he was a rich and prosperous man he dismounted slowly and deliberately as if he wanted every one to understand that he was too great a personage to do anything in a hurry the merchant's handsome clothes made the slender young man who stood near him waiting patiently for the way to be clear look even shabbier than he would otherwise have done and surely that was quite needless his surtout was threadbare his horse was thin as a rake and the rider himself was not so very much stouter his an oxford student a clerk or i miss my guess thought the watchful man on the gallery i'll warrant he'd rather have a score of books than all the costly robes the merchant ever brought across the channel he's a philosopher but he does not seem to know how to turn base metal into gold after the oxford student came two men who were talking quietly together one a successful lawyer wearing a cloak with a silken girdle all studded with little ornaments the other was plainly a wealthy country gentleman he had red cheeks and a long white beard he carried a two-edged dagger and a heavy silken purse hung at his side near these two stood a group of well-to-do folk a haberdasher a carpenter a weaver a dyer and a draper they were all dressed in the livery of their guild and it was evidently one of wealth and importance all that they wore was fresh and new and handsomely made even their knives were tipped with silver instead of brass they had no idea of trusting to whatever sort of food they might find on the way and they had wisely brought their cook along with them a brown-faced sea captain had rolled himself off his steed rather awkwardly for he was more accustomed to a ship than a horse 
he wore a tunic of heavy frieze and around his neck was a cord from which hung a dagger his beard has been shaken by many a tempest thought the watcher on the gallery and as he looked at the sailor's determined face he said to himself i should not like to be among his prisoners if i mistake not he has made more than one man walk the plank all this while good harry bailey was going in and out among his guests welcoming them to the inn he bowed low before the doctor in his silk-lined gown for a doctor who knew the causes of all diseases must be treated with respect he jested gaily with a red-cheeked woman from bath as he helped her to alight her hat was broad as a buckler she wore scarlet stockings and bright new shoes i'm an old traveller she said i've been on pilgrimage before i've been at rome and cologne and three times at jerusalem and she walked into the house with the air of one who had plenty of money and knew how to get the worth of it two men were going up the steps side by side they looked so much alike that it was plain they were brothers though one wore the dress of a ploughman and the other that of a priest both had earnest faces and the man on the gallery looked at them kindly and said to himself there's a priest who will not run away from his country parish to find an easier place i can fancy him taking his staff and setting out afoot in a storm to see a sick man both of the brothers together did not take up so much room as the miller who came after them in a blue hood and a long white coat he was a stout broad-shouldered fellow who would be sure of winning at a wrestling match i can break any door by running my head against it he had boasted on the journey his beard was as red as a fox and when he opened his mouth it looked like a great fiery furnace under his arm was a bagpipe for it was he who had made all the skirling and shrieking as they were coming up the road he was a very different man from the dignified knight the kind-hearted priest and the country gentleman with his pleasant cheery face so too was the summoner whose business it was to call before the church court any one whom he found breaking its laws he looked so crafty and cruel that a child would have been afraid to come near him a huge wreath was on his head and hung down over his red face the man on the gallery smiled as he thought people always put out a bush when they have wine and beer no sword or buckler had he and it is hard to see how he could have managed a buckler for he had all he could do to take care of a great round cake that he had brought with him a pardoner rode beside him his long yellow hair hanging down upon his shoulders for he fancied it the latest fashion to wear a cap and so he had put his hood into the wallet which lay on the pommel of his saddle the two men might well go together for they were both cheats and got all the money they could from poor people who trusted them or were in their power last of all came the steward of an inn of court and the reeve of a manor their faces were keen and shrewd and one could see that they would make sharp bargains with whoever had dealings with them these were the people who had come to the tabard inn they were all going on a pilgrimage to canterbury and unlike as they were they were glad of one another's company for it was a journey of three or four days and the larger the party the safer they were from robbers now there was bustle and tumult at the inn serving men running here and there 
and stable boys shouting to one another as they rubbed down the horses and put them into the stalls the kitchen boys played tricks on the cooks and the cooks scolded the kitchen boys but it was not long before an agreeable fragrance began to fill the house and soon the pilgrims were summoned to their supper it was hardly more than the middle of the afternoon but most people dined at ten in the morning and the guests were ready for all the good things that their host had provided the boards had been brought in and laid upon trestles then came the landlord followed by serving men each one with a towel around his neck and another on his left arm after them came the kitchen boys with various dishes bowls and napkins were passed around that the guests might wash their hands before the meal a somewhat desirable thing to do as one wooden trencher generally served for two persons and forks had not yet been invented the meats were cut into strips and the guests dipped them into the sauce as they ate the summoner devoured his meal greedily and woe to the one who shared his trencher for not a whit did he care if his whole fist went into the gravy he swallowed garlic and onions by the handful scattering lavish portions of his food over his unlucky neighbours he gulped down the strongest wine and held out his cup again and again very different were the table manners of the prioress her little hand never went deep into the sauce for at most she wet only the tips of her slender fingers she knew how to carry a morsel from the trencher to her mouth without dropping the gravy and before she drank she always wiped her lips so carefully that never a bit of grease was left on the cup she had listened well when tales were told of how people behaved at court and she tried to practise the same manners she had learned french too in her school days she was delighted at the opportunity to use it and never guessed that it was the french of stratford at bow rather than of paris that she spoke such a feast as it was for the hungry travellers there were fish and fowl and meats of several kinds lamb and pork served with ginger sauce and roast beef served with garlic and vinegar there was the flesh of the wild boar generously seasoned with mustard there were bacon and pea soup and the most amazing of puddings and pasties manufactured of all sorts of remarkable articles mixed together and with many kinds of spice whose amount was limited only by their costliness strong wine or brandy was poured upon these compounds and then they were set afire and were brought in with flames shooting up to the low rafters there was plenty of wine served in goblets of wood and of pewter and there was ale in abundance for southwark was famous for its ale long before the supper was over the early guest had made friends with the whole party he had talked of warfare with the knight and of hunting with the monk he had praised the singing of the friar and had made a neat little compliment to the pretty prioress he had discussed with the merchant the danger of meeting pirates in the channel had asked the priest about the poor people of his parish and had promised the loan of a book to the student he had even jested with the summoner about his buckler of cake and had playfully demanded of the miller whether he never took toll three times from the same bag of grain every one was happy and good-natured they washed their hands paid their reckoning and agreed to start early the next morning but now harry bailey had a word to say he was tall and manly and fine-looking during the supper he had sat in the seat of honour by the pillar and he had been the gayest of all 
now he said sirs you are heartily welcome for you are certainly the merriest party that has been in this inn for a year i'd like to do something to please you and i have been thinking of a pastime that will amuse you and won't cost you a penny you are going on a pilgrimage and may god give you good speed but there is no use in riding along as dumb as a stone i know you mean to tell stories and enjoy yourselves now i have a plan and if you do what i propose and are not the merrier for it i'll give you my head what is it tell us what it is cried the pilgrims and he replied this is it that every one of you shall tell two stories going and two more on the homeward ride and the one that tells the best story shall have a supper at the cost of the rest of us and he shall sit in the place of honour here by this post when we have come back again and to help carry out the sport i will go with you at my own expense as guide and if any one opposes what i say he shall pay every shilling that we spend on the road if you like this just say the word and i will make myself ready everybody was pleased and asked him to be their leader and the judge of the stories a price was set for the supper and the pilgrims all agreed to follow his decision in everything wine was brought and they drank together in good fellowship but now the sun was set and every one went to his rest End of chapter one chapter two of the chaucer storybook this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jamie Kravitz, San Francisco, California. The Chaucer Storybook by Eva March Tappan. Chapter 2 The Knight's Tale. In the morning, when day began to break, Harry Bailey awoke the pilgrims, and they all set out at a comfortable gait. When they had gone about two miles and had come to a place called the Watering of St. Thomas, he stopped his horse and said, Sirs, you remember what we planned last night if you've not changed your minds let us draw lots to see who shall tell the first story and may i never again drink a cup of wine or of ale if the one that refuses does not have to pay all that we spend on the road now draw before we go any farther the one that draws the shortest is to begin sir knight said he now draw your lot come my lady prioress mr clerk don't be so modest come forward every man each one drew and whether it was by chance or whether the wily landlord had so arranged it the fact is that the lot fell to the knight of course he would not break his agreement and he said so i am to begin the game and tell the first story am i let us ride on then and see to it that you listen well to every word so the pilgrims started up their horses and the knight began his story this is the tale that he told palamon and arcite one once upon a time there was a duke named theseus who was lord of athens he was a great warrior and one land after another had yielded to his sway at length scythia too fell into his hands and there he found a wife as well as a kingdom for he married hippolyta the queen of the country there was a great wedding as you may imagine and there was such pleasure at athens that as the duke and his beautiful bride drew near to the city walls they could hear the shouts of rejoicing just there the road made a turn and behold full in the way of the bridal procession was a company of ladies all robed in sombre black and kneeling two by two not a word did they say but they wept and wailed and caught hold of the duke's bridal rein with such lamenting as was never heard in the world before who are you that disturb my feast with your crying are you so envious of my happiness speak out and if any one has done you a wrong tell me what i shall do to avenge you so said the duke 
then spoke the oldest of the ladies her face as white as death have mercy upon us she pleaded pity us and help us for fourteen long days we have awaited your coming to beg for your aid for we are not but beggars now though once every one of us was either a queen or a duchess then duke theseus and the queen hippolyta and the men-at-arms and all the long procession stopped and listened to the sorrowful tale of the ladies in black it seemed that at the siege of thebes their husbands had all been slain and creon lord of thebes had declared that the bodies should be given to the dogs and should receive none of the honors of burial duke theseus was so sorry for the poor ladies that he felt as if his own heart would break he leapt down from his horse and raised them from the dust and comforted them as best he could i swear to you he said as i am a faithful knight that your wrongs shall be avenged not one half day will i tarry even to celebrate my wedding and before long it shall be told from end to end of greece how theseus put to death the wicked creon do you keep watch and ward over my bride he bade his chamberlain and lead her safely into athens there was not time for another word the duke had already flung out his great white war banner whereon was a blood-red figure of mars with glittering spear and shield beside the banner waved a pennon of richest gold into which was beaten the image of the minotaur that once he slew in crete so it was that duke theseus and the noblest of his army rode on to the walls of thebes and called the king forth to battle the duke slew the wicked creon and put his men to flight he even took the city by assault and tore down the wall beam and rafter to the mourning women he gave the bodies of their husbands that the rites of burial might be bestowed then he pitched his tent on the battlefield for the night and made himself ready to return on the following morning to athens and his bride hippolyta all that night the pillagers did their work on the field of battle and stripped the dead bodies of mail weapons and garments and it chanced that lying in a heap of the slain they came upon two young knights on whose tabards the same device was richly embroidered by this device the heralds knew well that the young men were the sons of two sisters of the blood royal of thebes it may be that the duke will take ransom for them thought the pillagers and they carried them gently to the tent of theseus for the life was not yet fully gone from them theseus would accept no ransom he sent the two knights straight away to athens to be flung into prison then he and his army rode homeward and he wore a crown of laurel as a victor in his castle he dwelt in joy and honor but closely guarded in a tower of stone abode palamon and arcite for those were the names of the two young men and they dwelt in suffering and misery now when hippolyta came to athens she brought in her train her young sister emily who was fairer than the lily upon its stalk of green and fresher than the may-time with its new-blown flowers for truly her bloom was like that of the rose it came to pass one bright may morning that she arose from her sleep and went out into the garden her dress was dainty and pretty and adown her back fell her braid of golden hair a full yard long up and down the paths she strolled picking here and there a flower of white or red to make herself a wreath she was singing softly and truly her voice was like that of an angel now the dungeon tower of the castle rose hard by the garden wall and palamon was pacing to and fro in a chamber high up from the ground there was a little window closely grated with heavy bars of iron and through it he could see the city or if he looked downward the castle garden as the fates would have it he caught a glimpse of emily thereupon he turned pale and cried ah as if he were pierced to the heart at that arcite started up and called cousin cousin what troubles you you are white as death why did you cry out for god's sake be patient for we can do naught else our evil stars have given us this fate and we must endure it o oh, cousin replied palamon it was not because of our prison that i cried out but because of the beautiful beautiful maiden in the garden down below the love of her has pierced my heart and it will surely be my death i know not whether she be woman or goddess perchance it is venus herself and down upon his knees he fell and prayed aloud o venus if it be indeed yourself help us out of this dungeon have pity upon us 
then arcite looked through the iron barred window and caught a glimpse of the maiden and he too was grievously wounded by her beauty alas he moaned if i may not have her favor if i may not at least see her close at hand i shall surely die what demanded palamon do you say this in jest or in earnest in earnest replied arcite may god help me i am in no mood for jesting then palamon knit his brows angrily i am your cousin and your brother in arms said he and we have sworn solemnly never to hinder each other in love or in any other case but to help each other as most we may and now like a false traitor you dare to love my lady whom i shall love and serve so long as my heart shall beat i loved her first and told my love to you and you are in honour bound to help me or else you are but a false traitor and a treacherous knight you are more likely to prove a false knight than i arcite replied proudly and indeed you are already false you do not even know whether she is a woman or a goddess you love her as one might love a saint but i love her as a woman and i told you so as my sworn brother even if you had loved her first don't you know the old saying who shall give law to a lover a man cannot help his love if he die for it but my brother we are prisoners for life no ransom will set us free there is small chance that the fair maiden will ever look with favor upon either of us love her if you will but so shall i and that is the end of it dear brother we must stay here in prison and each of us must bear his fate now it came to pass that a certain noble duke named perotheus a childhood friend of theseus came to athens to visit him they had known each other in thebes for many a year and loved each other most tenderly duke perotheus begged for his freedom and finally to give his friend a pleasure duke theseus set the prisoner free but beware he charged for if ever you are found in any part of my realm you will lose your head by the sword then was our sight free and he went to his own home but he wept and wailed and groaned and cried aloud and even sought to take his life alas that ever i knew perotheus he lamented but for him i might have dwelt forever in the prison of theseus how blissful should i have been to see her whom i love and serve even though i might never win her favor oh dear cousin palamon he groaned the victory is yours you are in prison indeed but it is a paradise for you may sometimes cast your eyes upon my lady you were a knight worthy and skilful and by some change of fortune you may some day win your heart's desire but neither earth air fire water nor any creature made of them can help me or give me comfort alas we know not what we pray for i thought that if i could only get out of prison i should be happy indeed but since i cannot see you emily i might as well be dead on the other hand palamon when he knew that arcite was gone made the tower echo with his groans and cries oh my cousin arcite he wailed little do you care now for my suffering you are free and in our own thebes it will be easy for you to get our kinsfolk together and make so fierce a war upon this town that by treaty you may have emily for your wife while i weep and wail here in this prison tower and my heart is pierced unto death with the love of her now tell me said the knight all you who be true lovers which one was in the worst case palamon or arcite palamon could see his lady every day but he could never be free from his prison arcite was at liberty to wander whither he would but never again could he set his eyes upon the love of his heart two now when arcite had come to thebes he sighed and groaned full many a day and thought no one ever had such trouble as he he grew pale and thin his eyes were hollow he cared not for meat or drink and when the time for sleep had come he lay on his bed and moaned and groaned all the night long after a year or two of this suffering he dreamed one night that the god mercury stood before him and said cheer up arcite you are soon to journey to athens and there your woe shall have an end then arcite started up from his sleep whatever comes he declared i will go to athens life or death i will see my lady he caught sight of his face in a mirror and it was so changed that he said to himself if i but take some lowly place 
I can live in Athens all my life unknown and see my lady every day. Straight away he dressed himself as a poor laborer, and with a squire in like disguise, he went to Athens the next morning, and to the very gate of the palace. Fortune favored him, for when the chamberlain of the fair Emily saw the young man at the gate so stout and big of bone, he hired him at once to hew wood for the fires and to carry water. For a year or two, Philostrate, as he now called himself, did the work of a servant, but he was so courteous and so kindly that the whole court loved him and begged Duke Theseus to put him in some higher position. So Theseus made him squire of his chamber and gave him gold to maintain his rank, never guessing that each year the squire's revenue from his own estates was brought him privily. For three years Arcite lived in this happiness and so won the heart of the duke that there was no man dearer to him. All these seven years poor Palamon was pining away in his prison, but in the seventh year, on the third night of May, it came about that by the help of a good friend he got free. He fled as fast as ever he could to a grove where he meant to hide all day, and then when the night had come to make his way to Thebes. There he intended to beg his friends to help him make war upon Athens, and thus he would either lose his life or win Emily as his bride. Now the busy lark, day's messenger, was greeting the gray dawning with her song. The fiery sun was rising, and all the east was laughing with the light, and the warm beams were drying in the groves the silver drops that hung upon the leaves. It chanced that on that very morning Arcite arose early and rode out to the fields to pay his homage to the month of May. He galloped onward a mile or two, and then, as fortune would have it, he rode into the very grove where Palamon was hidden. He was in search of hawthorn leaves for a wreath, and as he rode he sang for joy, Welcome, welcome, lovely May, trees and flowers are fresh and gay, grant me hawthorn leaves, I pray. After he had roamed about as he would, and had sung all his merry roundelay, he suddenly turned grave, as lovers are wont to do, for in their moods they are first up, then down, like a bucket in a well. He sat him down under a tree and sighed. Alas, he said, for the day that I was born. Here am I of the blood royal of Thebes, and I serve my mortal enemy humbly as his squire. I dare not avow my own name. I am no longer Arcite but Philostrate. O cruel Mars and Juno, it is you who have destroyed all our race save wretched me and Palamon, whom Theseus keeps in prison. And besides all this, my heart is pierced through and through with the fiery darts of love. Emily, Emily, it is for you that I am dying. And down he fell in a trance. Palamon had heard every word, and he felt as if a sword had been run through his heart. He shook with anger, and with face deadly pale, he started out from the thick bushes and cried, Arcite! false and wicked traitor as you are that you dare to love my lady for whom i bear all this woe you are of my blood and have sworn to be true to me you have cheated duke theseus and you bear a false name i am palamon your deadly enemy and now even though i am barely escaped from prison and though i have no kind of weapon yet one or the other of us shall die for you shall not love my lady emily arcite drew his sword fierce as a lion if you had a weapon, and if you were not beside yourself with love, you should never leave this place alive, he said. Love is free, and I will love her in spite of all that you can do. Tonight I will bring you meat and drink and bed, and tomorrow I will come here secretly with two suits of armor. You shall choose the better, and I will take the worse. Then, if it should chance that you are victor, you may have your lady for all me. And so they parted for the night. It came to pass as Arcite had said, and in the morning, without any word of salutation, each helped the other to arm, and then they fought with their sharp spears as savagely as if Palamon were a lion and Arcite a tiger, and soon they were up to their ankles in blood. Now Duke Theseus was a famous hunter, and as luck would have it, he set forth this very morning in pursuit of a great deer that he had heard was in this grove. With him rode his queen Hippolyta and her fair sister Emily, dressed all in hunter's green. Behold, when they came to the grove, there were Palamon and Arcite, fighting as fiercely as two wild boars. 
the duke spurred on his courser and in a moment he stood between them stop he cried and drew his sword who strikes another blow shall die who are you that dare to fight here as if you were in the royal lists then said palamon what need is there of words we both deserve death and we both are weary of our lives slay me and slay my fellow as well for know that he is our sight your mortal enemy who is banished from your realm on pain of death he called his name philostrate and for many a year he has deceived you because he loved emily and could not live away from her i am the wretched palamon i have broken out of your prison and i as well as he am your mortal foe i too love the fair emily and so fervently that i would die in her sight the duke responded your own mouth has condemned you and you shall surely die at this the queen and emily and all the ladies of their company began to weep they fell down at the feet of the duke and begged for mercy upon the prisoners whose only fault was their love at first the duke had been exceedingly angry but pity rises soon in a noble heart and he said to the cousins at the request of the queen and my dear sister emily i forgive you but you must swear never to do harm to my country but to be my friends and help me in every way that you can the knights took a solemn oath that they would be true to him and then he continued so far as lineage goes either of you might wed a princess or a queen but you know well enough that even if you should fight forever emily could not marry both of you now go freely where you will and fifty weeks from to-day return each with one hundred knights armed and ready to fight i give you my word as a knight that he whom fortune favours shall have emily for his wife down upon their knees fell palamon and arcite and every other person present and thanked the duke with all their hearts then joyfully the two young men set out for their home city of thebes three when the appointed day had come the cousins appeared in athens each with his hundred knights well armed for battle never was there so noble a company before for every man who would win honour for his name had pleaded to be one of the number each one was armed to suit himself some wore coats of mail some breastplates and short tunics some wore plate armour and some carried prussian shields some were well guarded on their legs and carried axes and others bore war maces of steel with palamon came lycurgus king of thrace a tall broad-shouldered man with heavy black beard under his shaggy eyebrows he glared about him like an angry hawk his long hair black as a raven's wing hung down his back and a massive wreath of gold rested on his head sparkling with rubies and diamonds over his shoulders a coal-black bearskin was thrown he did not ride on horseback but according to the custom of his country in a golden chariot drawn by four white bulls a score or more of white boarhounds as big as steers leaped about him and in his train there came one hundred lords with brave fierce hearts with our sight was the renowned emetrius king of india he rode upon a bay horse with steel trappings and a covering of cloth of gold his tabard was of silk thickly embroidered with great white pearls his saddle was of burnished gold over his shoulders was no rough bearskin but a mantle embroidered with sparkling rubies his curly hair was as golden as the sunshine his nose was high his eyes were bright his lips were full and his colour fresh and if lycurgus looked about him like a hawk emetrius's glare was like that of a lion and his voice was like a trumpet on his head he wore a wreath of laurel and on his wrist he carried a tame eagle white as a lily tame lions and leopards ran about him as he rode with him were one hundred lords in all their armour save their helmets they were richly dressed for in this company were dukes and earls and even kings so it was that early sunday morning the rival parties came up to the city duke theseus led them within the walls and made a bounteous feast to do them honour with viands rich and gifts to great and small and noble minstrelsy on monday morning two hours before the dawn palamon went to the temple of venus and prayed for her help naught cared he for glory or the renown of victory he said all he asked was to have emily for his wife and if he could not have her he begged that he might die in the contest 
the statue of venus trembled and made a sign to him my prayer is granted he cried and went home joyfully three hours after palamon had gone to the temple emily too set out to offer sacrifice and ask for the favor of diana she and her maidens went to the temple of the goddess bearing with them incense handsome robes horns of mead and coals of fire emily's golden hair was all unbound and on her head lay a wreath of green oak leaves she kindled two fires upon the altar and thus she prayed to pure diana o goddess thou dost know well that i would ever have my freedom and die like thee unwed i pray thee that the ardent love of palamon and arcite may be turned from me to some other maiden or if my fate decrees that i must become the wife of one of the two grant that i may fall to him who loves me most then there came to pass a marvel indeed for one of the fires went out then blazed again and straightway the other fire too went out but as it paled and died away there was a strange whistling sound like that which a wet log makes when it is laid upon a fire and at the end of the firebrand there trickled out full many a drop of blood of scarlet red it was small wonder that emily wept with fear for who could tell what this might portend then there came to pass an even greater marvel for before the terrified maiden stood the goddess herself dressed as a huntress and bearing bow and quiver she spoke to emily gently and said my daughter do not grieve it is decreed of the gods that you shall become the bride of one of those two who for your sake have borne such suffering but to which of them the fates forbid that i should disclose read well my altar for the fires will reveal your fate and in a moment she was gone the fires will reveal your fate emily said over and over to herself but what the prediction meant she could not understand o oh, kind goddess she cried i give myself to you i put myself under your care and protection and then she left the temple and went quickly to her home arcite too sought the favor of the gods and at the fourth hour of the morning he went to the temple of mars to make sacrifice to the god of war and thus he prayed o powerful god in every land the fate of battle is determined by thy word i beg thee to look kindly upon my sacrifice pity my suffering and think upon the days when thou too didst burn with love for venus and didst grieve and sorrow when not to thee but to vulcan she was given i am young as thou wast then and i have experienced little of life and yet i know right well that my suffering is greater than men ever endured before for she who has so pierced my heart cares not whether i live or die by force of arms i must win her ere she will show me favor help me in my battle on the morrow and the glory of the victory shall be thine i promise to hang up my banner and my arms in thy temple and to do it reverence so long as i shall live my beard and hair which never yet have felt the touch of razor or of shears i will sacrifice to thee and i will be thy true and faithful servant to the last day of my life to arcite too was shown a marvel the doors of the temple shook the fires blazed up so bright on the altar that the whole building was aglow and the ground gave out a fragrant smell arcite stood still in wonder then he cast more incense upon the fire and as he gazed he heard a gentle ringing come from the god's coat of mail and a low voice that murmured victory and arcite went back to his inn as happy as a bird in the sunshine now there was trouble on olympus for venus had agreed to help palamon and mars had promised the victory to arcite jupiter was at his wit's end and at last he called upon saturn and asked that from his long experience he would devise some way to bring about peace then said saturn to venus weep no more my child thy palamon shall have his lady as thou hast promised and yet in due time there shall be harmony again between you and mars four all that monday there was feasting and jousting and dancing but on tuesday at the dawn of day there was heard from every inn the stamping of horses the clashing of arms and then the tramping of hoofs as party after party of lords on steeds and palfreys rode up to the palace gates the suits of mail were quaint 
and rich with finest work of steel embroidery and goldsmithing bright were shields and testers and trappings helmets of beaten gold and hauberks lords sat upon their coursers in gorgeous array knights formed in long lines of retinue squires were busy nailing heads upon spears buckling helmets fitting straps to shields and lacing armor with leathern thongs no one was idle the foaming steeds champed their golden bits the armorers ran to and fro with files and hammers there were yeomen on foot and crowds of the common sort with their short staves there were pipes and trumpets and drums and clarions the palace was full of people roaming about or gathered in little groups to discuss the champions that man with the black beard will win said one no rather he with the bald head declared another one stood by a certain knight because he had a grim and savage look and another upheld his favorite because his battle-axe weighed full twenty pounds duke theseus did not leave his chamber till both the theban knights had come to the palace then he seated himself at a window in most handsome array the crowds pressed closer and closer about him near at hand was a high platform and on this stood a herald ho ho he cried and when the people had become quiet he told them the will of the duke our gracious lord hath considered in his wisdom that it is a foolish waste of noble blood to fight this tournament as if it were a mortal battle this then is what he decrees on pain of death let no man bring to the lists any kind of dart or pole-axe or short knife or short sword with biting point no one shall ride more than one course against his fellow with a sharp ground spear though he may defend himself on foot if he will he that is overcome shall not be slain but brought to the stake that shall be set on either side and there he shall remain and if it chance that the leader on either side be captured or slay his adversary then shall the tourney come straight away to an end god speed you go forth to the contest fight your fill with long sword and with battle hammer now go your way this is our lord's decree the people shouted till the heavens rang god bless our gentle lord they cried who forbids the useless shedding of blood the trumpets sounded and up through the streets all draped with cloth of gold rode the brilliant troop first came the noble duke theseus with palamon on his right and arcite on his left and after them rode the queen and her sweet sister emily then followed the long rich procession and before it was fully nine in the morning they were at the lists never were there such lists in the world before the ground was a mile about there were walls of stone and beyond them a moat seats rose above seats to the height of sixty paces to the east there was a gate of white marble and to the west there was its fellow it might well be a splendid theatre for whenever duke theseus had heard of a man who was skilled in building or in carving he had offered him food and goodly wages if he would come to him and do his best that pious rites and sacrifices might be paid to the gods an oratory with an altar was built above the eastern gate in honor of venus and above the western gate stood another in honor of mars to the north in a turret on the wall was a third oratory rich with white alabaster and red coral these were the temples to which the two young knights and emily had resorted to make their respective appeals such was the place where the tournament was to be held now when duke theseus and the queen hippolyta and the fair emily and the ladies-in-waiting were seated and the whole company had found places then through the western gateway under the chapel of mars came arcite and the hundred men of his party with a banner of scarlet red at the same instant palamon passed with his followers through the eastern gate under the chapel of venus his banner gleamed white and his face was brave and hardy never were there two such companies for the wisest man in the world could not have seen that either was less worthy than the other in wealth or age or bearing they drew up opposite each other in two fair lines the herald read the names from his list that every one might see that there was no treachery or deceit then the two gates were closed and he cried in a loud voice do your devoir you proud young knights the trumpets and the clarions re-echoed 
the spears on either side went firmly into rest and the sharp spurs pierced the flanks of the horses the arrows splintered on the heavy shields one felt a sharp stab go through his breast spears sprang up twenty feet on high swords flashed out like silver helmets were split and shattered blood burst out in fierce red streams bones were crushed by the mighty blows of the battle hammers the war-horse stumbled and fell and his rider rolled under his feet like a ball one man thrust with the butt of his broken spear and another on horseback trampled him down one was so badly hurt that he was taken prisoner and brought to the stake another was dragged to the stake on the opposing side and then duke theseus bade them rest and drink if so they would many a time had the two cousins met each of them had unhorsed the other twice no tiger whose whelp had been stolen was ever so savage as arcite no lion was ever so mad with hunger for the blood of his prey as was palamon for arcite's life the strokes fell heavy upon their helmets and the red blood flowed from both all things however have an end before the sun had come to its setting while palamon was fighting fiercely with arcite king emetrius struck him a terrible blow with the sword palamon striving with arcite as he was turned upon his foe and bore him a sword's length out of his saddle it was all in vain and palamon struggling against them every step of the way was seized and by the strength of twenty was dragged to the stake king lycurgus had gone to his rescue and he too was struck down then indeed was palamon in sorrow for not another blow might he strike and as soon as duke theseus saw what had happened he cried hold the fight is done and emily belongs to our sight of thebes then arose such shouts of rejoicing that it seemed as if the very walls would crumble venus up above wept till her tears dropped down into the lists and cried verily i am disgraced for ever but saturn replied peace daughter peace mars has his wish his knight has all that he asked and soon you too shall have your will and now while the heralds were shouting and the trumpets blowing and the people crying aloud for joy behold a wonder came to pass arcite had doffed his helmet and was galloping along the lists he looked up to his emily and in return she gave him a friendly glance but saturn had gone for aid to pluto king of the lower world and from the ground full in the face of arcite's steed there flashed out a flame of the infernal fire the frightened charger leapt aside foundered and flung his rider upon the hard earth his breast crushed with the saddle-bow and bleeding sorely sadly they lifted him up and carried him to the palace they freed him tenderly from his armor and laid him in a bed and all the while he called for emily duke theseus came home with all his retinue there was great rejoicing for it was said not only that arcite would not die but strange to tell that not one man of the whole company had been slain to be sure the breastbone of one had been pierced with a spear and there was many a broken bone and many a wound but some had salves and some had charms or drinks of healing herbs all that night there was revelry and feasting in honor of the stranger lords the noble duke did his best to honor every man and give him comfort though truth to tell small comfort was needed for there is no disgrace in making a slip or falling nor is it a shame for one man to be dragged to the stake by the might of twenty that there should be no envy or jealousy between the two parties the good duke theseus had the fame of both sides cried abroad for three full days he entertained the whole company with royal feasting and when the time came for them to go to their homes he gave them noble escort a long day's journey on their way but now it came to pass that the wound of arcite would not heal and soon it was spread through the city that he must die when arcite knew this he sent for emily and also for palamon o oh, my lady whom i most dearly love he said alas for the pains that i have borne for you queen of my heart farewell for the love of god raise me gently in your arms and listen well to what i would say for love of you i have had strife and anger with my cousin but now i tell you frankly that in all this world there is no other man so worthy of your love as palamon 
hardly had he thus spoken before the chill of death came over him his sight grew dim and his breath began to fail but still he kept his eyes upon his lady and his last word was emily then palamon cried out with grief and emily wept both night and day and in the town young and old grieved for the death of arcite no man sorrowed more than theseus and the good duke sought how he could pay most of honour and respect to his friend at last he concluded that the funeral pyre should be built in that same grove where the cousins had fought their fight for love he sent for a bier and draped it all with cloth of gold the richest that he had with cloth of gold he robed our sight white gloves were drawn upon the dead knight's hand and upon his head was laid a laurel crown while in his right hand was placed a sword of keen bright edge the duke gazed upon the face of his friend and wept so that it was sad to hear him then that the people might one and all look upon the knight whom they loved the duke had the body carried to the hall and that soon re-echoed with their cries of mourning hither came palamon with unkempt beard and hair rough with ashes his clothes were black and well bedewed with tears hither too came emily the saddest of all the company then duke theseus bade three noble white steeds be led forth all trapped with glittering steel and distinguished by the arms of our sight on the first steed sat a rider who bore the dead man's shield on the second was one who held his spear and on the third a man who carried his turkish bow with its case of beaten gold the noblest of the greeks took up the bier and then their eyes red with tears they passed slowly through the main street of the city where all was draped with mourning on the left walked duke theseus and on the right his aged father aegeus carrying in their hands golden vessels well filled with honey and blood and milk and wine after them came palamon with a noble train and sorrowing emily bearing a brand of fire in the grove a mighty pyre had been reared first many loads of straw were spread upon the ground upon that was laid dry wood well split then green wood of fir and birch and elm and ash and oak and many other kinds spices rich and rare were sprinkled upon the heap and it was draped with cloth of gold and jewelled broidery garlands were hung upon it bright with flowers and over it all handfuls of myrrh and sweet-smelling incense were cast so lofty was the pyre that the green branches reached upward to the skies and so broad was it that it stretched out full twenty fathoms when the sorrowing company had come to the little grove then emily herself must kindle the funeral fire for such was the custom of the land she touched the dry wood with the torch the fire blazed up and at the sight she fell fainting to the ground as the fire burned men threw into it their jewels their raiment their spears and shields with cups of wine and milk and blood three times the greeks rode all about the pyre with piercing cries three times with clashing spears three times the women called aloud when the pyre had burned to ashes they went sadly back to the city and palamon returned to thebes now after several years had passed athens planned to form an alliance with certain countries a parliament was to be held in that city and duke theseus asked palamon to be present sorrowful and still in mourning garments palamon bowed before the duke and stood in silence waiting to learn his will then theseus sent for emily and when the place was hushed he spoke the creator of this world has decreed he said that all things shall have an end the oak lives long but at the last it falls even the stone on which we tread wastes away as it lies by the roadside every one must die page and king alike therefore ought we to make a virtue of necessity and not rebel against him who guides the course of all now without doubt a man is most sure of honourable fame who dies in the very flower of his excellence and his truest friends should rejoice at his death in the midst of his honours rather than when old age has made his deeds forgotten and his service is no longer remembered why do we longer mourn that our beloved arcite has left this life in the glory of his knighthood 
why do his cousin and his bride who loved him so well murmur at his well-being they only fret his soul and their own hearts therefore i urge that we no longer grieve but that even before we leave this place we make of two sorrows one perfect joy to last forevermore sister said he this is my edict given forth with full agreement of my counsellors that noble palamon your own true knight who loves you with all his heart and has so done since the first day that he saw your face shall feel your tender mercy and shall become your lord and husband give me your hand in token of your womanly pity then he said to palamon i believe that little arguing is needed to win your assent to this come near and take your lady by the hand so came it to pass that with all joy and song palamon became the husband of his chosen lady emily loved him so tenderly and he served her so devotedly that never was there a word of jealousy or any other trouble between them and to the end of their days they lived in health and wealth and happiness end of chapter two chapter three of the chaucer storybook this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Drexler. The Chaucer Storybook by Eva March Tappan. Chapter 3 The Man of Law's Tale. The Story of Constance. When the knight had ended his tale, everyone in the company, old or young, declared that it was a noble story. Harry Bailey cried heartily, That's going well. The budget is open, and now let us see who will tell the next sir man of law he went on you agreed to obey my commands now keep your promise surely replied the lawyer i have no thought of breaking my agreement a promise is a debt and i would ever keep my word the laws that we make for others we must ourselves obey and without delay he began his tale the story of constance in syria there once lived a company of merchants who were so successful that their spices and satins and cloth of gold were sent far and wide. In the course of their business it came about that they spent some time in Rome. When they returned to Syria the Sultan sent for them, as was his custom when they had been journeying to foreign parts, that he might learn about other kingdoms and hear of whatever wonders they had seen. The merchants told him much about Rome, of the greatness of the buildings and the magnificence of the emperor. But the beginning and end of every story was Lady Constance, the emperor's fair daughter never was there such a maiden since the world began they said she is the most beautiful woman in the world and yet she has no touch of pride she is young but indeed she has no foolish childishness she is kind and charitable she is the embodiment of courtesy and her heart is the very chamber of purity the merchants returned to their homes but their words did not fade from the memory of the sultan by day and by night he thought of the beautiful maiden and at length he sent for his privy council and charged them upon their fealty to get him constance for his wife the privy councillors were at their wits end it is some evil magic they whispered to one another but to the sultan they said sir we are the faithful servants of our blessed prophet mohammed and we do greatly fear that no christian ruler would give his daughter in marriage to one who obeys the prophet's laws but all the sultan would reply was i will be christened rather than lose her keep your fears to yourselves and get me constance then there was much journeying to and fro ambassadors were sent to the emperor and to the pope and to men of mark either in the church or in knighthood the ambassadors were sent from them to syria the sultan agreed to become a christian if he might have constance and finally after much debate and discussion it was decided that for the advantage of the true faith the emperor's daughter should become the sultan's wife then throughout rome went the emperor's command that every person in the town should pray most earnestly for a blessing upon the journey and the marriage constance wept sorely that she must go far away from her home and friends to live among a barbarous people and become the wife of one whom she knew not but the decree was passed she said meekly christ 
Give me grace to obey his will. And she set to work in heaviness of heart to make ready for the marriage. When the day had come to take ship, she bade farewell to all and went on board. And with her went a long train of lords and ladies and knights and bishops and also a great weight of gold to be her dowry. Now the wicked mother of the sultan had done everything in her power to oppose the will of her son. When she saw that this was of no use, she planned to bring about by trickery what she could not accomplish by honest means. One night she secretly called her own counselors together, and when they had come she took her seat, and thus she spoke, My lord, you all know that my son is about to prove false to the laws which God gave by his blessed apostle Muhammad. But for me I will tear the life from my body rather than the Koran from my heart. If you will follow my advice, I promise you that we shall dwell safely on earth to our day's end, and after that shall realize all the joys of heaven. Each one took a solemn oath that he would stand by her and would persuade as many of his friends as possible to do the same. And then she revealed her cruel plot. First, we will let them baptize us as Christians. Cold water will not hurt us, and after that I will give a feast, and the sultan's wife shall be made so red that it will need a whole font of water to wash her white. As the evil woman had planned, so it came to pass. She went to the palace of the sultans and said with feigned sorrow, My son, I grieve deeply that I have been a heathen so long a time. I will no longer believe in Mahomet, and I am ready to be baptized by a Christian priest. And grant, she pleaded, that I may make a feast for the Christian folk. If they will but come to me, I will do my best to please them. The sultan was so rejoiced that he hardly knew what to say. He fell upon his knees before her with great joy and thanked her most heartily. Now when the Christian folk had come to land, the whole Syrian kingdom turned out to meet them. There were vast crowds of Syrians and of Romans, all dressed in her richest array. But most brilliantly attired of all was the mother of the sultan and certainly no daughter could have been greeted more tenderly than was the gentle Constance by this enemy who plotted night and day for her ruin. And as for the sultan himself, no words can tell the joy with which he welcomed his beautiful young bride. After a little the time was at hand when the Christians should be entertained by the mother of the sultan. Truly she had kept her word, for the tables were loaded with dainties from every part of the kingdom, and from many a realm that was far away from the land of Syria. But suddenly the signal was given, and almost in a moment the sultan and all the Christians at the board were struck down dead, save Constance alone. The sultaness, for by this murder of her son the wicked woman had made herself ruler of the kingdom, on that same day flung the helpless Constance into a rudderless vessel and thrust it out upon the sea. Get to Italy as best you can, she cried pitilessly. The dowry that Constance had brought with her was put on board the ship, and by someone's kindness a store of clothes and of food was added. When Constance found herself alone on the deep sea, she knelt down, and upon her breast she made the sign of the cross, and piteously she begged, O holy Christ, be with me, and when the day comes that the stormy waters shall swallow me, keep me, I pray, from the powers of evil and bring me unto thy everlasting bliss. Day after day went by until three years and more had passed. He who had saved her from the slaughter at the feast cared for her now, and kept her from all harm. The ship drifted on and on, far beyond the seas of Greece, and at length it floated through the strait that lies between the Moorish country and the land of Spain, and out into the wide, wide ocean. One morning it came close to far Northumberland, and rising from the shore, Constance saw a castle. A storm wind drove the ship upon a sandbar, and so fast was it that even the coming of the tide had no power to set it free. The constable of the castle saw the wreck, and he went down to the shore. There was the broken ship, all beaten by the waves, and on his deck stood the weary, lonely woman, and with her the great treasure that had been her dowry. She begged for pity, and the good constable, brought her tenderly to the shore. And when her feet first touched the land, she kneeled down and thanked her God with grateful heart for this mercy that he had shown her. While she knelt and prayed, the constable stood one side and wondered, for he and his were heathen, and so were all the folk of that part of the land. 
The constable carried her home to his good wife, Hermagild, and whose kind people were so grieved to see the stranger's plight that they wept for pity and promised that she might abide with them as long as she would. She would give them no word of who she was or whence she came, but she was so kind and thoughtful and so ready to serve and please all who came near her that every one who even looked into her face had to love her, whether he would or not. Hermagild loved Constance as her life, and by and by it came to pass that Hermagild and Constance knelt together and offered up their prayers to the God of the Christians. Now the heathen had overcome all that part of the country, and most of the Christian Britons had fled to Wales. Some few remained here and there in the land, but they did not venture to meet together to worship God, and dared not for their lives avow themselves of his followers. Not far from the castle gate were three of these, and one of them was old and blind. One summer's day the constable and Hermagild, his wife, and Constance, his guest, were walking together toward the sea when they met this blind man, bowed and old, and with his eyes tight closed. For Christ's sweet sake, he cried, give me my sight again. O Lady Hermagild, Open mine eyes for the love of Christ. Then Hermagild trembled lest her husband should hear the holy name and slay her. But Constance bade her be brave and heal the man if such were God's will. God gave her power to open the blind man's eyes, and the constable cried in astonishment, What does this mean? Constance replied bravely, Sir, this only shows the power of Christ to help his people out of control of the evil one. And then she told him of the Christian faith so clearly and so earnestly that before the sun had set, the constable, too, had become Christ's humble follower. In the town not far from the castle, there dwelt a sinful knight, and when Constance refused his wicked love, he swore that she should die and by a shameful death. One night when the constable was from home, this knight stole like a poisonous serpent to the chamber where Hermagild and Constance lay asleep. He crept softly to the bedside, and with a silent stroke he cut the throat of Hermagild. Constance, wearied by her prayers and vigils, slept on quietly and did not rouse even when the murderer laid the bloody knife close by her side. The constable made no long tarrying, but came home soon and joyfully, for King Allah was to be his guest, and when he heard the piteous tale, he told it to his king, and also told him of Constance's coming to their land in a strange ship alone upon the sea. The knight declared that she must have done the cruel deed, and Constance was so overcome with grief and fear and amazement that she stood almost silent before her judge and had no word to say of her own innocence. Still, when the king looked upon her pure face, he could feel naught but pity. The people, too, declared that she could never have been guilty of such wickedness. She is pure and good, they said, and she loved the Lady Hermagild even as her life, and so said every one that dwelt in the castle. The king would have proved her innocence or guilt by the test of battle, but the daughter of the mighty emperor stood alone, without a friend to serve as her champion. The king felt such pity that the tears dropped from his eyes, but justice must be done, and he said, Bring me a book, and if this knight swear solemnly upon the book that Constance was the slayer of Hermagild, then shall a justice be straightway named to give her trial. The book was brought, and the knight laid his hand upon it in all boldness. It contained the writings of the four evangelists, and when the evil man had touched the holy volume and declared on solemn oath, that Constance was a murderer, he suddenly fell to the ground like a stone, smitten by an unseen hand, and the voice was heard saying, Thou hast wronged the daughter of my holy church. At such a marvel all the people were aghast, and all, save Constance, stood in deadly fear of what might happen. Then Constance told the king and all the other folk about the god whom she worshipped, and it came to pass that King Allah and many of the people of the place gave up their heathen worship from that day. The wicked knight was put to death, and when a space of time had passed, King Allah took fair Constance for his wife. All in the land rejoiced at the marriage, save one alone, and that was Donegild, the mother of the king. She was angry that her son should choose for his queen a strange woman, come from no one knew what corner of the world. 
Nevertheless, there was a wedding and a great feast with dancing and singing. Not long after the wedding, King Alla was forced to go to Scotland to meet his enemies in battle. Before he went, he carried his wife to a bishop, who was also his constable, and bade him keep watch and ward over her until his return. Now it came to pass that Constance bore a child, and then the bishop sent a messenger and bade him ride at full speed to carry to his king the blissful news that Constance was the mother of a fair young son. The messenger cared more for his own gain than for his duty, and he said to himself, If I go out of my way but a little, I can carry the joyful news to the king's mother also, and thus win a double reward. So this faithless servant rode out of his way and went to the home of the king's mother and gave her reverent salutation. Madam, said he, I have news to make you happy and blithe, and to make you thank God a hundred thousand times. My lady queen is the glad mother of a fair young son, and all the land from end to end rejoices. See, madam, here is the sealed letter with the news, and I must bear it as swiftly as I can, that the king too may delight in the good tidings. If so, be that you would send a message to him, I promise to serve you faithfully both night and day. Donna Gild answered, The hour is late, and I have no letter writ. Tarry, and until the morning, take your rest. I will then have ready a message for the king. She plied the messenger with wine and ale, and while he slept the sleep of swine, she stealthily slipped out the letter from his casket and wickedly prepared another to put into its place, and signed it with the name of the bishop. This is what the forged letter said, quote, The queen has a child, but it is no proper human babe. It is such a horrible fiend-like creature that no one in the castle dares to stay near it. The mother of such a child is surely nothing less than a fiend, unquote. When the king read this letter, he was sick at heart, but he told no man of his trouble. He wrote a letter to his bishop and gave it to the messenger. Therein he said, God's will be done. Keep the child, be it foul or fair, and guard my wife till I am again at home. Whatever be tied, welcome be the will of God. He sealed this letter, weeping bitter tears of sorrow, and soon the messenger went his way. The faithless servant had no mind to miss the good wine and ale of the king's mother, therefore he went straightway to her abode. She made him welcome as before, and did everything that she could to please him and entertain him. He drank as heavily as at his first visit, and again he fell into a swinish sleep. The letter entrusted to his care was stolen from his casket, and in its stead one was placed which said, The king commands his constable to thrust Constance, once the queen, from out of the kingdom. He is to place her and her child and all that is hers on board the ship on which she came, and push it from the shore and charge her that she never again be seen within the limits of the realm. All this he is to do before three days and a quarter of a tide is gone, and if he fail, his head is forfeited. Such was the letter which the faithless messenger carried to the bishop, and when the good man read it, he cried, O mighty God, how can it be that thou wilt suffer the innocent to perish and the wicked to prosper? Alas, woe is me! I must either become the executioner of the good Constance, or die a shameful death. There is no way of escape. Throughout the kingdom there was weeping by young and old, but at the dawning of the fourth day, Constance, her face as pale as death, went down the path and toward the ship. When she had come to the shore, she knelt upon the sand and prayed, Lord, whatever thou dost send is always welcome to me. And she said to the sorrowing folk around, he who cleared me from a false charge when I first came to this land can also care for me on the wide ocean, even though I see not how. He is no less strong than he was before. I trust in him and his mother, and that trust is for me both rudder and sail. Her little son lay in her arms weeping. Peace, little son, she murmured, and then she cast her eyes upward to the heavens. Mother Mary, she cried, Thy child was tortured on a cross, and thou didst see all his torment. No suffering can compare with thine, for thy child was slain before thine eyes, and my child lives. O oh, little one, she said to her babe, what is your wrong? You have never sinned. Why will your cruel father take your life? Then turning to the constable, she pleaded, O oh, dear kind bishop, 
Can you not let my little child stay here with you? But if you dare not save him from harm, then kiss him once in his father's name. She gave one long look back to the land, said softly, Farewell, cruel husband, and walked toward the ship, hushing her child as she went. And when she reached the water's edge, she humbly crossed herself, bade the thronging crowd farewell, and stepped aboard. Food and clothes there were in plenty, for even her merciless enemy dared not send her away without. But she and her babe were on the wide, wide sea with none save him above to care for them and give them comfort. Soon after this, King Allah came home and bade the constable send him the queen and her child. A chill struck to the heart of the good bishop, for he saw that somewhere there had been treachery. He told the king the piteous tale and said sadly, Behold, Sir King, your letter and its seal. Grieving but on pain of death, I have given my best obedience to your will. The king ordered the faithless messenger to be brought before him, and under pain of torture he confessed where he had spent the night and went on his way. So step by step the king traced out the whole sad story and knew it was his own mother, who, false to the allegiance she had sworn to him and to his rule, had driven his loving wife unto her death. Be she my mother or my most bitter foe, so said King Allah, no deed like this shall go unpunished. And straightway the wicked woman was put to death, but night and day the lonely ruler grieved for wife and child. Constance for five long years drifted hither and yon upon the sea. But the good father kept her and her little child in his loving thought, and she was brought safely out of every danger. The ship floated sometimes east and sometimes west. Sometimes it turned about and moved north, and then driven by some current or a changing wind, it drifted far to the south. Then through the narrow way between Morocco and the land of Spain it was borne, and far, far to the eastward. Behold, full in its path there came a mighty vessel, all bedecked with banners and shields of victors. A Roman senator was in command, and when he saw the lonely woman on the stranger's ship, he took her to his own vessel and brought her and her little son in all kind gentleness unto his wife at Rome. Own aunt was the wife to Constance, but the wanderer would tell no story of her past, and so, although for a long while she dwelt in the family of the good senator, no one guessed that she was the daughter of the powerful emperor. In faraway Britain, the sorrow for her loss was not forgotten. Night and day King Allah mourned for his wife. Then, too, he had other reason for sadness, for he was guilty of his mother's death. At length he made a vow to go to Rome, for he thought that after he had obeyed the Pope's commands in great things and in small, he might dare to hope that Jesus Christ would pardon him his sin. When it was told in Rome that King Allah was near at hand, then the noble senator and many other men of rank set out with a glittering retinue to meet the royal pilgrim. Many honors were shown him, and to return the courtesies, King Allah gave a feast at which all the luxuries of the world were set forth in abundance. The little son of Constance was to be taken to the feast, and while his mother robed him in his best, she bade him do her will. Stand in full view of the king, she said, and look him clearly in the eyes. I thought him once a kindly man. It may be that for you he will have some bit of gentleness even yet. And then she kissed her child and let him go. The boy obeyed his mother's word, and Allah, noticing the fair child who gazed at him so eagerly, asked who he was. That is beyond my power to say, replied the senator. All I know is that his mother is as good a woman as lives on God's earth. And then he told the story of how, sailing home in victory from vengeance on the Syrians, inflicted at the emperor's command, he had met a strange ship with no one on her save this child and a lonely woman. Straight away King Olive forgot the noble company, forgot the feast, and remember only how like his lost queen's face was that of the fair child. Could the boy's mother be my wife, he mused, and then he chided himself for his idle folly, my wife is long since dead, he thought sternly. But into his heart there came the trembling hope. It was on a lonely vessel that she was brought to my country. May not Christ, who saved her once, have held her in his care a second time? He could hardly wait for the guests to say farewell, and as soon as they were gone he hastened homeward with the senator. Constance was bidden to come meet the king. 
she stood before him trembling swooning silent pale as death for in her heart was the old love of him mingled with sorrow and with just anger at his cruelty and she had no word to say but at the first look king alla knew his bride the whole sad tale was told and the king swore solemnly that as he hoped for god's mercy on his soul he was as guiltless of such cruel treachery as was maurice their little son and now when constance found she might believe that he was innocent and that his love for her was pure and strong as in the earlier time in far away northumberland there was such happiness in the hearts of those two as never before was felt by mortals in this world there was even more joy to follow for at the wish of constance king alla made a feast to which the mighty emperor was humbly bidden he sent his gracious word of acceptance and when the day had come king alla and queen constance rode out in eager thought of happiness at hand to meet their guest when the queen looked upon the emperor's face she slipped down from her palfrey and fell meekly at his feet and cried father i am your constance have you clean forgot your youngest child i am constance whom you once sent to syria it is I who has thrust out upon the briny sea and doomed to die. Send me no more into the heathen lands, but thank my Lord here for his gentleness. Sorrow and joy were mingled in the meeting, but soon the sorrow was all forgotten, and never yet was there a feast so glowing with happiness. After many days had passed, King Ulla and his queen returned in joy to their own far kingdom, and there they lived in quiet and peace. And when the time had come for God to take King Alla from the world to his bright heaven, then Constance made her way to Rome, and there, together with her father and her friends of old, she dwelt in holiness and deeds of alms. And when the emperor had passed away, the child Maurice, now grown a strong and wise and stalwart man, was set upon the throne. End of chapter 3《ハッピーバースデーとは、あなたの名前を教えてくれるのは、あなたの名前を教えてくれるのは、あなたの名前を教えてくれるのは、あなたの名前を教えてくれるのは、あなたの名前を教えてくれるのは、あなたの名前を教えてくれるのは、あなたの名前を教えてくれるのは、あなたの名前を教えてくれるのは、あなたの名前を教えてくれるのは、あなたの名前を教えてくれるのは、あなたの名前を教えてくれるのは、あなたの名前を教えてくれるのは、あなたの名前を教えてくれるのは、あなたの名前を教えてくれるのは、あなたの名前を教えてくれるのは、あなたの名前を教えてくれるのは、あなたの名前を教えてくれるのは、But the landlord put an end to it by saying to the prioress with all knightly courtesy, My lady prioress, if I were sure that it would not give you the least annoyance, I would decree that you should tell the next story. Would you kindly vouchsafe so to do, my dear lady? Gladly, the prioress replied, and without delay began the tale of Little Hugh of Lincoln. There was, once in a great city of Asia, a quarter in which the Jews were allowed to live. At the farther end of the street was a school where children were taught to read and to sing. Among these children was a little boy, seven years of age, a widow's son whose name was Hugh. He was so young that he had small book knowledge, but his loving mother had gently taught him whenever he saw the image of the Blessed Mother of our Lord to kneel before her and say his Ave Maria with deepest reverence. So it was that his heart became full of tenderest worship for Our Lady, and as he sat in school with his primer, he listened to the older children singing O Alma Redemptoris, and almost without knowing what he did, he crept nearer and nearer and listened to the words and the music until he knew the first verse and could sing it. Of course, he did not know the meaning of the Latin words because he was so young, but he begged an older boy to tell him, and even knelt before him on his little bare knees, so eager was he to know the meaning of the hymn. At last the older boy said, Little you, we have been taught that this hymn was written to our blessed lady, and that as we sing it we are praying her to be our help and comfort when we die. I cannot tell you any more about it, for I am learning singing, not grammar. Then if this song was made in honour of Christ's dear mother, thought the child, I will surely learn it before Christmas. I will do all I can to show her reverence, even though I am chidden or even beaten three times in an hour for not studying my primer, I will learn the hymn. Every day, as they walked home together, the older boy taught little Hugh the hymn, till he knew both words and notes, 
and then he sang it boldly, loud and clear, both on his way to school and also on his return. O oh, Alma Redemptoris, his sweet voice rang out, for his heart was so filled with the love of Christ's dear mother that he could not cease his singing. Satan, the evil one, would not endure this song of praise, and he said to the Jews of the quarter, Will you allow such a thing? Will you permit that boy to go about among you and scoff at you and your laws? Thereupon the Jews agreed to do away with the child. There was a wicked murderer who lived in an alley in a dark and secret place, and they hired him to seize the singing child as he passed by, and cut his tiny throat, and cast his little body down into a pit. This was why the poor widow waited all night long for her boy to come from school, and when the first ray of light was seen, she started out, her face pale with anxiety and fear, to search for him. She asked at the school, and wherever else he was wont to go, calling constantly on Christ's mother to come to her aid. Finally, she heard that he was last seen going down the street that led through the Jews' quarter, and of every Jew she met she begged piteously, "'Can you not tell me anything of my little son?' They answered no, and went their way, not caring for her grief. Still she searched, and the good God put it into her troubled heart to call the name of her lost child near the pit wherein he had been thrown. Here a great miracle was manifested, for down in the deep darkness of the pit the little boy lay, and though his throat was cut by the murderous knife, still he sang loud and clear his O Alma Redemptoris till all the place rang with the music. Many Christian folk were passing through the street, and as the sound of the sweet song came to their ears from that corner of the Jewish quarter, they came pouring in, amazed at such a thing. When they saw the child with his wounded throat, they quickly sent for the provost. He made no delay, but came at once, and after he had given praise to Christ and to his holy mother Mary, he bound the Jews with many a bond both strong and firm. He inflicted grievous torture upon them, Evil to him who deserves evil, he declared, and every guilty man was dragged by wild horses and then hanged upon the gallows tree until his death. The little martyr child was tenderly lifted up in the midst of piteous weeping and lamentation, and, followed by a long procession of those who wished to do him honour, he was carried to the abbey and laid before the altar. Beside the bier his mother lay swooning with grief, and all this while the sweet voice sang the hymn of praise. When the mass was done, the abbot cast holy water upon the child to make him ready for his burial. But little Hugh still sang in a sweet, strong voice, O Alma Redemptoris. Then said the abbot tenderly, Dear child, tell me why it is that, though your throat is wounded by the cruel knife, you still sing, O Alma Redemptoris Mater. The child replied, By nature's way I should have died many hours ago. But Jesus Christ, for his own glory, and for the worship of his dear mother, has bidden me sing, O Alma, loud and clear. I always loved the Blessed Mother, as far as a little child might do, and when I was about to die she came to me and bade me sing this holy hymn. And then she laid a grain upon my tongue, and said to me, My little child, when the grain is taken from your tongue, you will call to me no more, for I shall come to carry you away to be with me. Fear not, little one, for I will never forsake you. The holy abbot took away the grain from the child's tongue, and with a little sigh, the boy was dead. The abbot and all his monks fell down upon the ground, weeping and wondering and crying praise to Blessed Mary. And then they raised the little martyr from his bier and laid his fair young body in a temple of pure white marble. God grant that we may some day meet him in God's heaven. End of chapter 4。Chapter 5 of the Chaucer Storybook。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annie Rue. The Chaucer Storybook by Eva March Tappan, Chapter Five: The Nun's Priest Tale, The Cock, the Hen, and the Fox. When the prioress had ended her story of Little Hugh of Lincoln, the whole company looked thoughtful. 
this did not suit the cheerful host he turned to the nun's priest and said come you sir john tell us some pleasant tale to make us merry yes mine host replied the priest i will tell a tale and by my spurs it shall be a merry one then without prelude or introduction he began his story once upon a time a poor widow no longer young lived in a little cottage in a valley not far from a grove she had two daughters and only a small income but she was very economical and so they managed to live she cared for three pigs three cows and a sheep called mal of course her meals were scanty but she never needed any pungent sauce to give them flavor and she was never ill from overeating if she had wished to dance the gout would never have prevented her and surely apoplexy never hurt her head for she drank neither red wine nor white the two colors that were oftenest seen on her table were black and white for there were two things of which she had plenty black bread and milk she also had a bit of broiled bacon now and then and sometimes an egg or two this poor widow had a hen-yard and in it she kept a rooster called chanticleer there was not another cock in all the land that would crow as well as he his voice was merrier than the merry organ that plays in the church on mass days and one could tell the hour by his crowing better than any clock he seemed to know astronomy by nature for as soon as the sun had risen exactly fifteen degrees he crowed and he crowed so well there was no bettering it he was handsome too by far the handsomest rooster in the place his comb was redder than the finest coral and all notched in battlements like a castle wall his bill was black and shone like jet his legs and toes were of a beautiful azure his nails were whiter than the lily flower and his feathers gleamed like burnished gold about this cock were seven hens their color was much like his but by far the fairest was demoiselle partelota as she was called she was so courteous and discreet and such a cheerful companion and had behaved herself so excellently ever since she was a week old that chanticleer loved her with his whole heart and he was never happy away from her they often sang together and it was the greatest treat that could be imagined to hear them just at sunrise when their voices chimed in the song my love is far away it came to pass one morning early when chanticleer was sitting on the perch among his seven wives that he began to groan as if he was troubled by some bad dream pertolota sat beside him of course and when she heard him groan she cried sweetheart what troubles you what makes you groan the cock replied madam do not be anxious it was only a dream but it was such a terrible one that i am frightened even to remember it i dreamed that i was walking up and down the yard when i saw a dreadful creature somewhat like a dog and it tried to kill me it was between yellow and red its tail and ears were tipped with black its nose was small and its eyes glowed like fire that must have been what made me groan for i am afraid even now then said dame partelota fie upon you for a chicken-hearted cock pluck up your courage if you would keep my love for no woman can admire a coward we long every one of us to have a husband who is bold and brave and generous he must know how to keep a secret and he must be wise he must not be frightened at the sight of a knife and he must not be a braggart are you not ashamed to tell your love that you are afraid of anything you have a beard haven't you the heart of a man dreams are nothing and to think you are afraid of them dreams often come from overeating and sometimes when one has too much red humour that would make him see visions of arrows and flames of fire and red creatures that he fears will bite him that is what the red humour does just as the black humour or melancholy makes many a man cry out in his sleep for fear of black bears and bulls or black devils i could tell you more of humours that trouble men in sleep do you not remember that cato said pay no heed to dreams now dearest she continued when we fly down from here i pray you take some medicine there are herbs and berries right in our own yard that will cure you i will point them out to you madam the cock replied i thank you for your learning cato was a wise man 
but there has been many a man of greater wisdom than he who does not agree with him and who has learned by experience that dreams signify either joy or sorrow one of the most famous authors that men read tells the story of two men who set off together on a pilgrimage on the way they came to a little village so crowded that there was no room for them both in the same house one chanced to find a comfortable lodging but the other could do no better than to lie down in a stall with oxen all about him in the middle of the night the man who was well lodged dreamed that his friend called to him and said help me dear brother come to me quickly or i shall be murdered here in an ox's stall he woke with a start and then thought how foolish to be troubled by a dream so he turned over and went to sleep again the same dream came to him a second time and a second time he said how foolish and went to sleep a third dream came and this time the friend did not call for help but said i have been slain look at my gaping wounds i was murdered for my money then point by point the man told in the dream how it had come about at last he said if you would get up early in the morning and go to the west gate of the town you will see a cart full of rubbish don't be afraid to stop the cart for my body will be hidden in the rubbish this time the man did not say how foolish and as soon as it was day he went to the ox's stall and called for his friend the innkeeper said sir your friend rose early and went out of town then the man went to the west gate and there he saw a cart of rubbish looking just as his friend had described it in the dream at this he began to believe the dream must be true he cried out aloud for vengeance my murdered friend lies in this cart he declared fearlessly you officers who ought to keep this town i call upon you for vengeance and justice murder will out it is such a loathsome thing that god will not suffer it to be concealed the people gathered all around they overturned the cart and in the midst of the rubbish they found the body of the murdered man then the officers of the town seized the carter and the innkeeper and tortured them until they confessed the crime and straightway they were hanged you can see by this that there is truth in dreams and now look at that same book and the very next chapter beyond this i read about two men who wanted to cross the sea to a distant country they waited a long while for the wind was contrary at last it changed and blew just as they wished they planned to start early in the morning and went to bed happy but while they were asleep a wondrous thing happened for one of them dreamed that a man stood by his bedside and said if you sail to-morrow you will be drowned he started out of his sleep and called his friend and told him of the dream let us put off the voyage for one day he said but his friend only laughed at him for being so foolish as to trust in dreams no dream would ever frighten me he declared so that i would give up my business for it dreams are only nonsense people dream of all sorts of wild fancies that never were and never will be i see however that you are bound to stay here and lose the wind i pity you for your folly and i say farewell he went on board the boat and started on his voyage but before it was half done something happened i do not know what save that the ship sprang a leak and went to the bottom and the man was drowned and now dearest partelota you see that one ought not to be careless of dreams but let us not talk of this any more for when i gaze into your lovely face and see the beautiful scarlet red about your eyes i forget all about my fears i am so happy that i do not care a straw for any dreams or visions but now the dawn had come chanticleer flew down from the roost and called his hens and when he had found a kernel of corn he clucked to them and stood one side to watch them eat it and certainly no one who saw him looking as brave as a lion and walking up and down the yard on the tips of his toes as if he scorned the ground too much to more than touch it would ever imagine him afraid of anything and yet trouble lay but a little way before him as evil fate would have it 
there was a wicked fox that had lived for three years in the grove near the cottage for a long while he had been trying to plan some way to get chanticleer and that same night he had slipped softly through a break in the hedge into the yard and had hidden in a bed of cabbages there he lay watching with his half-shut eyes the noble rooster walking proudly up and down the yard the early morning had passed and nine o'clock had come dame pertalota the beautiful was bathing in the clean warm sand and her sisters were not far away chanticleer was singing as merry as a mermaid but suddenly he was watching a butterfly fluttering here and there among the cabbages he caught sight of the fox lying half hidden among them his heart turned cold and his beautiful music of crowing died in his throat he cried hoarsely ach ach in the greatest fear and another moment he would have run away but the fox spoke so gently and courteously that he could not help listening to him gentle sir said the crafty fox i beg of you not to fear so true a friend as i i should be worse than a fiend to do one like you any harm i pray you do not think for an instant that i came for any other reason than because i longed so eagerly to hear your singing from nigh at hand that i could not stay away indeed dear sir you have as sweet a voice as any angel in heaven pardon me for addressing you but truly i count myself no stranger to your noble family my lord your father god bless his soul and also your mother have honoured my poor house by becoming its guests but to speak again of singing i never heard any one except yourself sing so wondrous well as your father used to do at the dawning he had a habit of making his voice stronger by standing on tiptoe and stretching out his neck then he would close his eyes and send forth the sweetest music save your own that was ever heard and as for wisdom and discretion there was not a person anywhere in the world who could surpass him kind sir would you out of the pure goodness of your heart sing to me once more and let my fancy that i am listening to your father's voice no one had ever praised chanticleer so delightfully before of course he could not refuse so small a request to one who had shown how fully he enjoyed the best of music so he stood high upon his toes stretched out his neck closed his eyes and began to crow his song was indeed louder than ever before so loud that he did not hear the fox stealthily creeping closer to him and while he was straining his voice till the valley re-echoed with his crowing the treacherous fox caught him by the throat and ran toward the woods the cock upon his back when Troy was burned, the women wept and lamented, but truly never before was there heard such a crying and screaming as came from the feathered ladies of the yard, when they saw the terrible fate that had befallen their noble lord and master. Poor Dame Pertalota shrieked louder than all the rest, but the outcries of any one of them might well have reached the skies. The widow and her daughters heard the alarm and ran to the door. There were hens in the yard in the grove, and there was the wicked fox, the thief and murderer, running at the top of his speed with the rooster on his back. The woman cried, Stop! Stop! A fox! A fox! and ran after him as fast as they could go. The men caught up sticks and ran. The dog Call ran, and Talbot and Garland and Malkin with a distaff in her hand. The cow and the calf ran, even the hogs, for they were so frightened at the shouting of the people and the barking of the dogs that they ran, squealing all the way like very fiends. The ducks quacked as if they thought men were trying to kill them. The geese squawked, took wing, and flew over the tops of the trees. The swarm of bees came buzzing out of the hives and flew after them. And this was not all, for the people ran home to get trumpets of brass and boxwood and horn and bone they bellowed they blew they shouted they bawled they hooted and roared and yelled and howled and screeched and screamed till they raised such a hullabaloo as was never heard on earth before and all this time the fox was running toward the wood with a cock on his back some folk behave better when they are troubled than when all goes smoothly with them and chanticleer was one of these people 
he knew well that the fox could reach his hole before the pursuers could catch up with him and that whatever was done must be done at once he had grown far wiser since he had been taken prisoner and he said calmly to his captor sir if i were you i would defy all that rabble i would say to them turn back proud men a plague upon you all i am close to the grove and i will eat the cock in spite of you in faith declared the fox that is the very thing i will do but the cock was ready and the instant the fox opened his mouth to speak he broke loose flapped his wings and in another moment he was perched high upon a tree the fox was too wily to be put out of countenance by even such a surprise as this he looked up meekly into the tree and said in a humble voice my dear chanticleer i am heartily ashamed of myself and i beg your pardon most submissively i ought to have remembered that you were not used to my ways and would not have startled you so when i brought you out of your yard honestly sir i never thought of doing you any harm if you will kindly come down to the ground where we just may talk more comfortably i shall be glad to explain the matter to you no sir replied the cock with just a bit of an exultant crow may the fiends take me if you cheat me more than once you will not get me to sing and shut up my eyes again for no one will ever thrive who shuts up his eyes when he ought to keep them open End of chapter five